afternoon, everybody. Thank you to Wood O'Brien's for having us here today. Um, you get to sit through four of these. Um, I want to take just a second to introduce myself. My name is Tim Williamson. I'm general manager of Don John Smith. Don John Smith's one of the four providers uh, made up of uh, Don John Marine Company and Smith Salvage Americas. And we offer the Salvage Open 90 services. So what I wanted to do is give you my take uh, with regards to how we view things and some specific recent incidents. Um, we can go through the list of timeframes and uh, the specific salvage requirements. But as we all know, they all feed into each other, right? One's dependent on the other. And everything starts with having the VRP activated. Um, you can't stress this enough, notifications and having the VRP activated. Because the whole process, we went through the planning piece, starts there and nothing else can continue until that starts. Okay? So it's very important uh, when there is an incident, and we'll go through some of these uh, to activate us uh, and notify us and, and conduct a remote assessment. Okay? That may end there. That may be the end of it. You know, do a remote assessment, that's it. Uh, we've gone through the uh, incident command structure where we fit in with regards to operations. Obviously, not every case uh, runs with the full IC, and we adapt accordingly. Sometimes we're providing all the logistics, all the planning, et cetera. Right. So to start off with, I just wanted to marry with what we're doing with the exercise <clears throat> with sort of what's through salvage requirements and the resources and the capabilities that we can provide. Right. And I, I like to start with this uh, quote from Donald Rumsfeld. I don't know if anybody's, probably, some people have probably seen it or heard it, but the quote goes, reports that say that something hasn't happened are always interesting to me. Because as we know, there are known knowns, there are things that we know we know, and we also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> so, and that's very true with regards to salvage. Right? Most of the interesting cases that we run into seem run of the mill, you know, simple grounding, simple what have you. And it isn't until you start peeling that onion back where we're activated 24 hours after the incident has happened, where you start realizing, well, there were a whole bunch of unknown unknowns. This, uh, this is a specific re recent case that concluded uh, between the end of December and uh, January. Uh, this was on the seaway, okay? It was a, a vessel that went aground. Uh, we were notified of this pretty promptly, okay? Uh, and we were immediately caused for alarm because this isn't the Mississippi River, it's Rocky Bottom, okay? So most of the time there is damage when they go aground up there. But there was also another complicating factor. Seaway was closing. So yeah, she didn't have to go home, but she wouldn't be leaving for a long time if she didn't. So they were running into a lot of issues, especially with the locks. Ships were getting uh, frozen in the locks and whatnot, and the seaway was desperately trying to close, and this ship was aground. Okay? So it's, it's the important, and not, not everybody realized that when the incident happened. And that sort of you know, twinkled down uh, uh, as time went on. Okay? So under assessment and survey, there's a number of categories, and this sort of kicks off the whole process. Uh, with regards to salvage rigs and you know everything happens at its own time but it starts with the remote assessment and consultation which then kicks off the uh, assessment of uh, structural stability and other kinds of calculations that we would do okay um, uh, but that's just to start you're just poking at the known knowns right and the unknown no, uh, the known unknowns okay um, on-site salvage assessment we it's, it's a key component getting somebody there that's external to the vessel crew to start helping in the process of gathering information okay? we, we, we have a, a personnel everywhere that can accomplish that task okay? and getting the structural stability assessment complete and that all is tied in you really can't have that tied up and finished or a salvage plan or anything else in a lot of cases until you have a hole and bottom survey okay? so one thing is dependent upon another right? so the remote assessment and consultation is the first step um, it starts that dialogue. Not everything is going to be completed in an hour. Uh, it rarely is. But it starts the questioning process on the exact situation that everybody is facing with the current incident. Okay? And it helps us start to engage, in our minds, what type of resources we will have to mobilize for to help you, to assist you in your response. 
And then there's assessment and structural stability. Um, we've had a couple of recent questions that Mike uh, mentioned earlier with regards to new requirements um, on certain calculations being, being able, such as outflow analysis, oil outflow analysis, drift modeling, and spill modeling. We're able to provide all of those. This ultimately helps us to begin to do calculations and see if the situation is going to worsen over time or how it, how it ultimately are we going to solve the problem. Okay? So what you see on the uh, left hand on the screen is, is sort of is a, a vessel model with oil outflow and analysis. Okay? So in one minute increments and then jumping to eight at the last one. and that's after eight hours. Right? Stuff like that, being able to predict and calculate how the situation is going to evolve over time. Right? And the numbers. All of this feeds into the salvage plan and what the Coast Guard is going to require uh, taking a look at things. The other recent thing that has been a, a topic I've been asked about is drift modeling. Right? We're capable of doing that. So these obviously uh, useful. This is a, a vessel, a model of a vessel that is at anchor that broke free from her anchor. Okay. And at the top, you have the wind direction and the wave direction and how that's affecting the vessel. Okay. It's going to be used in a lot of situations, uh, especially remote situations, where you have a long lead time from where you, your tug uh, is available from, where to meet the vessel. So these, we can start these calculations pretty much immediately. Uh, it, it's helpful to have a specific hull model or in cases of container ships that have large sail areas, specific information with regards to that uh, in hand so that we can take that into account. But it's, uh, it's an example of, this is an example of a drift modeling that can be done. So it, it, we've heard about the planning key, and this is very much appropriate for with regards to what we do. And all of this uh, starts off with notifications and is in the stem of the key, okay? the assessment and survey process. So remote assessment consultation, starting the uh, computer models, calculations, et cetera, and then doing the on-site assessment. So why is the on-site assessment? Well, sometimes the crew yeah, it doesn't have the capabilities or the resources needed to get the full picture of the unknown unknowns or the known unknowns. Right? So here's a specific case that was in the Delaware River where we were notified that the vessel touched, touched bottom. Right? So luckily the QI quickly said, gear up to do a uh, hull, hull and bottom survey, which we did. Uh, the vessel was brought to the pier. Okay? And these are the, some of the pictures from the hull and bottom survey. And it turned out the uh, touch of bottom was uh, ripped out and, and did significant structural damage to the uh, uh, port side of the vessel and a good portion of the, the starboard side of the vessel. Okay? Enough so that uh, the class required her to go to a shipyard in the immediate vicinity. But again, something that you, it's almost impossible for the crew to tell without having an on-site assessment. Another such case was a, a tanker that we got notified for that was involved in a collision. Another vessel hit her while she was moored at a terminal. And in this specific case, we were notified that the elision happened. She broke free from her moorings, but she was safely at anchor. So this is what safely at anchor looks like. So actually the big concern for, for this with regards to pollution, is there was no pollution, just the damaged pier, was the barge uh, pier that she was now uh, resting against. 
uh, because there was no ability to, the furthest ability to shut off that pipeline was way upstream. So there would have been a large spill if she had them damage to that. But services that apply to this are not just the whole survey, but a type of bottom survey to see what exactly is underneath the vessel. And, and that affects the salvage plan on exactly what do we need to do to remove this vessel without inflicting, you know, not doing any harm, not doing any additional damage. You already had a couple breached ballast tanks, double hull ballast tanks. So looking into what we need to do to get her further without doing any, any damage. Okay? And that feeds into getting your hull and bottom survey and then completing the uh, assessment of structural stability. So once you have all that components of the first P, you sort of now have a very good idea, or should have a very good idea, what resources need to be mobilized. Okay? what kind of team, how many people, et cetera. Okay? So that all feeds into actually things that you're most concerned is costs, right? Um, we get notified we're not emptying the warehouse. Well, we have a warehouse in north of Houston, just north of here, and it's pretty much complete with anything you could need with regards to firefighting, lightering, uh, you name it, uh, we have it. Okay? But we need to know what we're dealing with um, in order to send the right resources, get it on a truck or get it on wherever, to get it to the vessel. And there might be cases where it's not in our warehouse, right? It's a specific, unique case that we need something out of the ordinary. You'll see an example like that. So then you move on to stabilization and uh, these various services, towing, salvage plan, um, lightering, uh, temporary repairs, etc. So this was a case, we know it was an active hurricane season last year, and we've had a number of different cases and jobs. Uh, but one of the cases we dealt with was two vessels that were scheduled to be scrapped, uh, were taken out under tow uh, to ride out the storm. Both broke free from the storm. And um, as a result, and that tugs couldn't make back up, we had to uh, prepare for uh, emergency towing to deal with these two uh, adrift vessels. Okay? And besides the tugs, uh, we needed some uh, type of towing arrangements, smith brackets, and other materials. Uh, welding gear, etc., to prepare the vessels for the long-term tows uh, to here to Texas. And as you can imagine, after hur hurricanes completely destroy the islands, you're dealing with massive logistical and other equipment issues. Uh, so the sooner you're better, you can get handled on that. Uh, it, it's 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 cheaper, uh, way easier for everybody else. Okay. And your salvage plan. Okay. What exactly are we going to do, and how? Okay. Temporary repairs. Uh, the gentleman that is with me today, Ken Edgar, uh, he's actually designed that patch, which was no easy feat. I, I, it, it takes one heck of a wooden wedge to, uh, to repair that. Um, but this was a bulker in the Columbia River that tore out her forepeak and one of her ballast tanks. Okay? She was fully loaded with grain, and it was almost nearly impossible or very difficult, very costly to uh, do any, any lighter. Okay? So a uh, temporary patch in that manner had to be put on so we could pump it out and then uh, uh, affect the repairs. And then there are cases where your first plan doesn't exactly, or your second, or your third, uh, solve the problem. Okay? And that's when you're in the loop. Uh, this, this specific case was, uh, it started actually in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this vessel um, which was carrying no hazardous goods in this tank, that uh, this uh, cargo hold that was affected, had an explosion and both her, both her hatches flew off into the ocean. Okay. She proceeded to Panama, uh, where there was fire investigators, uh, etc., that went on board to take a look. Then she proceeded to the Baton Rouge area, okay. and then she dis discharged uh, her remaining her other uh, holds. But when they got to this hold. They were still having uh, excessive readings of hydrogen, which caused the explosion, which doesn't take a lot to cause an explosion, and carbon monoxide. Okay? But when we were involved with this, we were trying to initially try to save all the cargo. Okay? Uh, it became qu uh, quickly apparent that that wasn't a feasible plan uh, due to the damaged nature of these, uh, the containers or the sacks that the cargo was in. Okay? So we had to adjust the plan. What was the cargo? Uh, on top of it, on top, the top cargo was uh, calcium chloride, which maybe not down here, but uh, northern parts of the country, road salt, okay? So pretty innocuous road salt. Underneath was more valuable type of cargoes as bauxite, uh, graphite, graphene, 
and uh, that was the cargo that they were really interested in saving. And once we cleared off the top layer of cargo, it became apparent that all the bags that th those other cargos were in were busted. So there was no way to lift without uh, dumping all the cargo. Okay. So when it became not cost effective to salvage the cargo, it became let's get it off the ship and have the ship go on her way. And that, that specific piece of gear is not in the regulations or required, but it's a remote control es uh, excavator. So that's used for because it had to be an intrinsically safe area due to the nature of the constant hydrogen production okay, uh, to remove the cargo for the grabs to get without having personnel in there. So I, I leave you with this um, with regards to kicking things off and getting information. Uh, not all the first pieces of information you get are, are the best or lead you to the same conclusion of what the information is trying to convey. And uh, this is a specific Lloyd's casualty report. Uh, General Cargo Marty Princess was in a collision with the Renee Schultz at this location. The Marty Princess has sustained damage to hull amidships, fully cellular container ship. Renee Schultz has sustained damage to her fork. No injuries reported, vessels in area to assist. Right? That draws a picture, right? That's the incident it's describing. So there's your uh, unknown unknowns, right? Uh, so that, that I'll leave you with. Uh, we look forward to participating uh, tomorrow, and thank you very much.